Hi, I'm here today to talk to you about the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Civil Service Association of Ontario. Now, we've come a long way since the horse and buggy days of 1911 and growing into OPSU that we are today. This convention, this celebration is dedicated to the thousands of sisters and brothers that gave their labor, volunteered their time, their blood, sweat and tears and their dedication into creating the strength that OPSU is today. And that strength provides us with a very, very confident future. If you need a helping hand, if you need to make a stand, if you need to carry the flame, don't forget we're all the same. It's time to celebrate, rise up and sing. Hundred years strong. That is where we belong A hundred years more That's what I It was an April evening in 1911 when 200 provincial government workers met to form what was to become the Civil Service Association of Ontario. The first meetings concerned mostly social events, but the group soon expanded its ambitions. You know, in 1911 when they were established, there were no industrial unions in Canada. There were none in uh, North America. Uh, and this was a, an organization that included uh, clerks, uh, secretaries, floor sweepers, uh, and all sorts of other agents all over the countryside. And so it had the form of an industrial union built into it. Of course, that they acted as a, a co-op to get a low-cost uh, coal originally. Um, they pretty soon got onto issues like pensions. How do you keep people loyal to uh, one employer, even if their wages are relatively low? you provide a benefit that they will get later on. And so they very deliberately set up a pension structure. It was for civil servants. They uh, labored along in a very, very small civil service by international standards. This province has been very well served by government employees. There's very little uh, corruption. There's almost always a merit-based test. and. CSAO was part of the apparatus that identified that as an issue and protected it. When they said modern, efficient, and loyal, they meant this is my life. That's what I'm doing for this employer. I'm, I'm making my lifetime career here. In return, I'm asking for a pension. Deputy ministers and senior managers dominated the early civil service association, but this changed after the Second World War in the period of the 40s and 50s. First you see the rise of the modern civil service which is looking after things like uh, hospitals. Uh, there's virtually no government, however radical it's striped, that has done more to put more things under public ownership than the governments of the 1940s, 50s and 60s. Think of the community colleges, the art gallery, uh, the science center, uh, just an incredible range of things that they thought government belongs here. And so as that happened, we went from about two to 3,000 civil servants right after the Second World War to about 60,000 in the, in the early 1970s. There were certain towns that would not have existed. They would have become ghost towns if it weren't for the government. As the provincial government grew, so did the number of women it employed. Women were overrepresented in the civil service. And so women who were working as a career, they were by and large working for the government. In comparison with other, other unions treated women as important as members of a, a union auxiliary. And I would say they did what would have been advanced at that time, which was 
they allowed women to join as full members and, and to also pay full dues even though they only got half the pay. The government did go out of its way to hire uh, people who were veterans. Well, that meant a couple of things. One is there are a lot of people there who knew how to take orders. <laughs> so they were people who thought they deserved something in the way of decent pay and, uh, uh, and benefits. And as a result, even though this remained an association rather than a formal union, it pressed very hard for very substantial wage improvements through the 50s. The transition from a social club to a union started with a hard lesson for the CSAO leadership. In the early 1950s, they set up a pretty fancy club at, uh, called the St. George Club. A few weeks after, the, I think, the 1952 uh, convention, uh, they found out that the organization was broke. They had to sell their private uh, club they'd set up, and uh, I think all the, uh, the entire uh, leadership and staff of the organization at the time retire, uh, resigned. And a guy by the name of Harold Bowen said, I'm going to take this little puppy over, and, and he managed to rebuild the organization from nothing. Powerful general managers like Harold Bowen and Jake Norman dominated the leadership for the next 20 years. Well, I would say there is some dissension in the association ranks, and I would say this is largely based upon feelings of frustration. But I go a little further and say that this frustration is not based upon the inefficiency of the association, but rather upon the efficiency of the procedures used in government to implement. In the mid-1960s, the province took over the county jails. The association registered as a union and began to organize new members in hospitals and college support staff. In 1967, the CSAO staged its first ever strike. Then all of a sudden came this Committee on Government Productivity, which was referred to by workers as the Purple People Leader. They basically said, here's where you sit and here's what you belong, and the thinking part belongs with management and management is not in the association. And the same thing happened within the um, uh, community colleges. This was the slogan of a campaign by the CSAO to force changes in SECPA, the Crown Employees Collective Bargaining Act. The government offer was presented on November the 17th at a history-making series of seven simultaneous meetings throughout the province linked by closed-circuit television. And the mood of the members was unmistakable. We shall not Everybody sing it out. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not The real issue was, I believe, that workers wanted to be treated with a sense of humanity that they felt that had been taken away from them and they were not about to let somebody just take it away from them. And so they wanted to have an organization that was run much more democratically than the old Civil Service Association was and that would express their ability to be full participants at work and in society. The year 1975 was a watershed as the organization adopted a new name and a new democracy. For the first time, executive board members were elected from all regions of the province. But the general manager soon became a problem as the members sought to run their own union. There was a, uh, a struggle. And the struggle was uh, between those who were content to have a general manager run the show and those who wanted a union that was run by the elected people. And this is the time for you to stand! So we, we fought the good fight to get elected control, and we got it. And Charlie Darrow was the president, the first president, who was the chief executive officer of the union. We demand an end to wage slippage. We demand a catch-up wage increase. We demand a cost of living protection. And we demand it now. By the late 1970s, the new OPSI was prepared to take on the boss, the Bill Davis Tories. Bill Davis was a very inclusive premier. We had lots of disagreements with him, but we also found common ground. The government uh, leaders would meet with the leaders of the labor movement on a regular basis. Out of those discussions came the 
Health and Safety Institute that was set up by the government, which was later uh, folded up by the uh, Harris government. To become a full-fledged union, OPSU needed to join the Ontario Federation of Labour and the Canadian Labour Congress, but there was a price to be paid. The CLC wouldn't let us because CUPE stood in the way, and the only way CUPE claimed jurisdiction over all the public service. The deal was made we'd have to join NUPTI. There was a lot of new blood in the union. The CAT support was the first group that uh, showed their energy and enthusiasm and the determination to fight for their rights. And they won self-respect out of that strike. Not much more, probably. And it was a, a lesson to other people in the union, other groups in the union, for people who didn't know anything about unions. They didn't know how to run a picket line, didn't know what a picket captain was, didn't know the duties. So all that had to be learned and had to be learned on the job. That same year, 1979, correctional officers walked out illegally for the first time and won their own bargaining table. But O'Flynn wound up behind bars. The issue with the correctional officers was a bargaining unit of their own. And we caught the government by surprise because the government never thought that their public servants would ever go on strike. Uh, I was sentenced to jail for 33 days and I did 23. There were people around who didn't see the need for a strike fund. And we had a constant battle to internally to get that uh, to get that uh, in place. The new strike fund would come in handy when college teachers struck for the first time in 1984. They had the right to strike, they exercised it. My recollection tells me that uh, they were quite successful in their goals of, of controlling workload. The rest of the union were delighted that um, they had members within uh, their union who had the right to strike and it gave new impetus to the members to demand the right to strike for uh, civil servants. Cutbacks and closures in the 1980s brought a new emphasis on organizing to protect public services. It's what I call a three-legged stool strategy. You know, organizing, negotiations, and community campaigning, the three-legged stool. You had to do all of those well. You know, you had to do community campaigning well if you're going to succeed in organizing or you're going to succeed in negotiations. So in OPSA, we built up our capacity to campaign, community by community by community. We created area councils. We funded, you know, we gave seed money to activists that wanted to go out and campaign on issues. So there's no other union in the country that negotiated better than our union did, 84 to 1990. And a big reason for that was, aside from the skilled people, we had staff, activists, but a big reason was the, our ability to campaign in communities. You know, went from town to town to town. Because the Peterson government started to uh, frustrate us, frustrate the union, frustrate the membership, we really stepped up our campaigning. So in OPSU in 86, 87, uh, 88, we, we might have uh, at any given time four or five different campaigns going a fight against closure of the psychiatric hospitals, a fight around uh, province-wide bargaining for ambulance services, a fight for more uh, education dollars to go into community colleges, a fight for uh, highways to, to stop privatization. So at any given, a fight to save the parks from being privatized. While the campaigns raged on, Opsu came under attack from the far right in a landmark Supreme Court battle. Merv Levine was a, a, a faculty uh, community college faculty, a teacher, uh, and when we were on strike, um, Merv Levine was a scab. He scabbed the picket line and he was um, writing and being picked up by some of the local papers up north and then the National Citizens Coalition, they took us to court, they tried to say that the union had no right to be involved in social public policy advocacy issues of the day. We ended up taking that case all the way to the Supreme Court before we won it. In 1989 at the convention when we passed a policy paper unanimously, it was called Peace, Environment, Poverty, the PEP program. 
We were actually the first union that drew attention to global warming. And uh, Stanley Knowles is one of the unsung uh, heroes, I think, in Canadian history. Uh, one of our finest parliamentarians. And uh, uh, a parliamentarian that understood that you had to stay on an issue and stay on an issue and fight for an issue. You really had to persevere. So in 89, uh, we named the award after Stanley Knowles. He was the first recipient. And of course, Nelson Mandela, ops who played a huge role in the late 80s in the fight back against apartheid in South Africa. Like the CSAO before it, OPSU turned its attention to pensions, but this time for control of the members' money. We decided that we'd go campaigning on pensions. Now, we were able to campaign because we'd been building up our capacity to campaign uh, so much over, the, over those uh, two, three, four years. So we were well situated to move, out, move this issue out. And the response we got was overwhelming and immediate. So much so that over the course of a couple of years we were sitting down at the table with the, the government. We actually had a deal in hand uh, late uh, in my term, um, but we walked away because the, the government was demanding too much for the joint administration of the pension plan that we, uh, we, we were seeking. Once the NDP came in and, and we were able to uh, negotiate the, the pension plan, the most important thing was that we have joint trusteeship of the pension. Now we have a pension plan that's worth billions of dollars. OPSU has had an ongoing commitment to social justice and human rights. The union established provincial committees representing women, rights-seeking groups, younger workers, and retired members. The Ontario Federation of Labour did a survey and declared that out of all the top unions in Ontario, that OPSU was by far the number one union in the province when it came to equity issues. Because I was the first and only black leader of a major union at the time, Jesse Jackson singled me out to have breakfast with him prior to the rest of the labor leaders in Canada meeting with the labor leaders in the States. I can recall how we used to consider ourselves second class, a second class union, because we didn't have the right to strike. And, and, and so we fought to become a full-fledged union by getting the right to strike. And I can, I can uh, recall standing on stage at a convention saying to our people that the day will come when you'll look back at today and say these were the better days for OPSU. OPSU's good relations with the Bob Ray government crashed with the social contract. That was quite a historical time, let me tell you, because uh, when the news broke that we were going to have what we now know as the social contract days, uh, it hit the labor movement by shock. I had established with the premier of the day, Bob Ray, that what they were interested in was uh, money. If they could save money, then we could save jobs. And I have members even today that come to me and say they would take the social contract any day over uh, what Mike Harris did to them. Uh, OPSU really met the challenge of the Mike Harris government. Um, the OPS had just gotten the right to strike and they took him on. Uh, I'm actually grateful that we didn't settle the contract when the NDP government was still in power because it allowed us to get language in the collective agreement which saved thousands and thousands of jobs and cost the government, taxpayer dollars unfortunately, but cost the government millions just to try and make things smaller in the government and of course we saw the results of that with Walkerton. OPS strike was the largest strike in Canadian history. 
And I think all the members of OPSU learned a great deal. Uh, the OPS members learned that they had a lot of power and how their work was going to be respected. Uh, the broader public sector realized that they weren't poor sisters anymore, uh, that they wanted more from their union and demanded it. Uh, and the colleges, uh, I think, got a, a nice lesson to say, guess what, you're not alone on the strike front anymore. So it really did build a lot of cohesion within the union. During the Mike Harris years, OPSU embarked on massive organizing drives to follow OPS members' work into the broader public sector. Uh, we, of course, were bargaining in the hospital sector, and the Allied Professionals Union was bargaining in the hospital sector. So it became obviously, well, quite clear to me that uh, we needed to have a discussion about how we were going to make sure that we got the best for, for all those members. And that resulted in the merger between OPSU and, and the Allied Professionals Group and, and uh, spawned the, the birth of the Hospital Professionals Division within OPSU. I was extremely proud of the hospital professionals group doing their walkout in 2003. Uh, the members were ready and it, was, it wasn't even about bargaining, it was about how they were going to bargain and those members were way ahead of their union on that strike. In 2005, OPSU completed a merger to reunite with the union representing Ontario Liquor Board workers. They had been original members of the CSAO. And I thought we could probably work very, very well with them and give them a lot of support across the province because there was always talk of privatization. They could use the support of a larger organization like OPSU. In recent years, OPSU has expanded its outreach to less fortunate people across the world. It was the day the convention endorsed the Stephen Lewis Foundation, the Live and Let Live Fund, uh, for our work on behalf of uh, AIDS uh, issues in Africa and here at home in Ontario and Canada and the, uh, the way the membership embraced the need for us to, to look beyond our own self-interest and step out and, and do some international work. OPSU was the first union to give money to the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa and I was at that convention and the motion that was passed as much as it takes for as long as it takes and I think that's when OPSU really started to get involved in uh, reaching out on social justice and humanitarian issues. In the summer of 2007, I believe it was, well, it hadn't been in president very long, we had uh, ended up with a series of, uh, we had seven strikes on the go at one time in the developmental services sector. That is, a, I, I think, a textbook example of what we did right. Uh, the union came together in an amazing way, and the end result of that was those strikes enabled us to influence cabinet to the extent that to settle the strikes, they put 220 some odd million dollars more into the sector. OPSU survived the Tories, but the election of the McGuinty Liberals poses special problems. We've been uh, celebrated some uh, successes with the Liberal government. They have done some good things, but they've uh, quite frankly double crossed us on a few other things. They've uh, not funded public services to the level at which they promised and they uh, you know, stay on this corporate tax cut course, which is uh, our many, many people, I think the vast majority of people uh, believe that's the wrong course. I'm Jimmy. My parents are both out of work, so it's my job to come up with our family's $500 contribution to the $2.4 billion corporate tax cuts. I figure it's the least I can do since the corporations are struggling so much that they had to lay off my mom and dad and move their factories to Vietnam. They've had it tough. And another tax cut here in Ontario might just help them hire more people. Of course, it'll probably be in Vietnam, but hey! So, to come up with the $500, I sold my hockey equipment. But I'm still playing. Oh. Ah. Ow. Ow. <laughs> as we move into the, our second century as a, as a union, uh, a lot of our challenges uh, are the same today as they were 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 25 years ago. It's about getting governments to recognize that services for people that are required by people, desired by people, are actually essential and that we will have a much better society. You know, we'll have people will live longer, live happier lives, crime rates will be lower if they properly fund those public services. The people that founded the CSAO in 1911, so our founders, uh, whether they realized it or not, they believed in social justice and they practiced it. Uh, so I think they set the stage uh, for what the CSAO became and for when we grew into a union 
So whether they did it consciously or unconsciously, uh, they actually established the organization in a manner in which enabled us to, over the hundred years, grow into the powerful force that we are today. Lève-toi et chante, ça fait déjà cent ans Et tout ça nous appartient, ça fait cent ans et plus Que c'est pour se battre pour toi Ça fait déjà cent ans Et tout ça nous appartient, ça fait cent ans et plus Se fosse mal